Okay, the primary topic of 2 Thessalonians deals with the topic of the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord. If you're uh, an Old Testament kind of reader and scholar, you'll recognize that is a phrase that was used a bunch in the, uh, in the prophets. The day of the Lord is coming. The day of the Lord is used to uh, describe one of two things. Either it's a day of joy and rejoicing or it's a, a day of disaster and woe. It's usually one of those things are involved. So uh, Paul here is talking about the day of the Lord. For reasons we will examine when we get to the second chapter, which we are now in, the brethren are being unsettled because some were saying that the day of the Lord had already occurred. As Paul typically does, he corrects this belief through the proclamation of the truth and logic. So we will wait to discuss these matters until the right time. But in this chapter, we will see it neatly divided into the following groups. The first two verses deal with, has the day of the Lord already arrived? Verses 3 and 4, Paul's response, the day has not arrived. And then in verses 5 through 12, hey Clary, in verses 5 through 12, he's going to deal with some additional information about the man of lawlessness. That's, we're going to spend the majority of our time dealing with that man of lawlessness. So, in 2 Thessalonians, and chapter 1, chapter 2, I should want to say chapter 1, 4. 2 Thessalonians, chapter 2. Remember in our last lesson, we dealt with those Jesus coming out of heaven with the mighty angels and flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and who have not obeyed the gospel. These will pay the penalty of eternal destruction. Remember that whole section? That's what we dealt with. So, here in chapter 2, in the first couple of verses, Paul says, Now we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, that our gathering together to him, that you may not be quickly shaken from your composure, or be disturbed either by a spirit, or a message, or a letter, as if from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has already come. Okay. In Paul's first letter to these brethren, he talks a lot about the Lord's coming and our being gathered to him. It seems, however, that the discussion uh, arises out of this discussion we're going to have uh, with these people here, out of a misunderstanding of chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. In 1 Thessalonians, in chapter 5, verses 1 through 11, sorry, Cheryl, you just have to take my word for this, uh, he talks about, you know, dealing with... Uh, well, uh, the day of the Lord and so on and so forth. Paul's concern seems to be motivated by the fact that some of the brethren are becoming quickly shaken from your composure or being disturbed. Apparently, their being unsettled seems to be caused by a message or a letter as if from us. Now, even though 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and the first 11 verses is clearly written in the future tense, these brethren, at least some of the brethren there, believe that in some way it has already begun. And uh, Barry, for you and Brenda, the, the rule is uh, if you have a question or a thought or a comment and you're, you, you, know, you want to get my attention by doing this, I probably won't see it. And so what I tell everybody is wait for me to inhale and then ask. <laughs> And I'll go ahead and get to it. So how this mis misinformation was obtained is problematic. It could have come, at least the way I'm reading this, it could have come in one of three ways. First, it could have come by way of a spirit. In other words, via a prophecy. Remember in Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 8, Paul's uh, amazed that they're so quickly deserting him, that uh, the gospel, you know, uh, uh, because of, well, uh, for a different gospel. But either someone, oh, Rex, quit fumbling around. Just go ahead and read it. Where he says, I'm amazed that you're so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another. Only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even though we... Or an angel from heaven should preach you a gospel contrary to that which you have, we have preached to you. Let him be accursed. As I've said before, so I say again now. If any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to that which you received, let him be accursed. So somebody might be saying, well, I received this from God. Apparently, there were many peddling false prophecies. Then as now, 
you know, someone might say, well, God spoke to me this morning and wanted me to give you this message. And, you know, that you hear some of these televangelists coming up with that sort of thing. Well, that's probably not new. Well, God spoke to me and said, and who are you to deny it? So that's what perhaps one of the things that they're doing. A second way this could have been transmitted to these brethren was through a message, Paul says in verse 2. This would refer to any non-miraculous message or teaching. Since it did not originate from Paul, it perhaps came from a traveling preacher. Uh, John uh, talks in his epistles about these itinerant preachers that would go from town to town, city to city, seeking to establish congregations and, uh, you know, preaching the gospel. Well, not all of them, not all of them were good guys. Not all of them were teaching the truth. Remember when Jesus wrote to the Ephesians in Revelation chapter 2, he says, I know your deeds, your toil, your perseverance, that you cannot endure evil men, but you put to the test those who call themselves apostles, and you found them to be false. And so there were those who were going around saying they were apostles and were teaching whatever they were teaching. But the test uh, is, if you wonder what the test is, the test is found in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 6. John says, uh, Beloved, we are from God, we being the apostles and prophets, if anyone knows God, he listens to us. If anyone does not know God, he does not know, he does not listen to us. By this you know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Remember in the first verse he said, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, for many false prophets have gone out into the world. Well, the test is, if they're saying the things that God said, then they're not false prophets. If they're saying something that God did not say, they are false prophets. Because God has given to us everything we need for life and godliness. So, uh, the third way uh, may have been a letter sent by some sort of forger. There were many forgeries written during the early days of the church. You can read uh, about such, uh, a, such pseudepigrapha uh, like the, uh, the Gospel according to Peter, the Gospel according to Thomas, that was a big one a number of years ago, the Gospel according to Barnabas, so on and so forth. Paul seems more concerned with the content of the message that they have received, whether by, you know, whoever gave it to them, uh, the day of the Lord has already come, than he is about, uh, and that this teaching is being attributed to him, that he is the source or origin of this min misinformation. Because Paul knows the source or the origin of this min misinformation, and so do you. Remember in John chapter 4, or excuse me, John chapter 8 and verse 44, Jesus tells the, the people who are listening to him that uh, Satan is a liar and the father of lies. You know, he does not say, whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own nature because he is a liar, and the father of lies. And so it's a lie. So the source of it ultimately is Satan. Uh, who, who sent it? Paul's not concerned about because naming names here is not, the, that his, not his point. Uh, I'm going to take this section... Wait a minute, for, wait a minute. Start, start again, Rick, second sentence. For he tells them that certain things, wait a minute. He's, okay, I finished that paragraph. I see where I'm at. Sorry, I'm back. See, it's not just you. In verses 3 and 4, let me go ahead and read those. We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brethren, as is only fitting because your faith is greatly enlarged and the love of each of you towards one another grows ever greater. Therefore we ourselves speak proudly of you among the churches of God for your perseverance and faith in the midst of all your persecutions and afflictions which you endure. And I am reading the first chapter. Okay, class is missed. <laughs> You know, I'd like to have that excuse, <laughs> but that ain't it. Okay, verses 3 and 4 of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 says, Let no one in any way deceive you, for it, that is the day of the Lord, will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. So, Paul declares that any claim that the day of the Lord has already arrived is false. Doesn't matter, it's just false. For he tells him that certain things must happen first, that is, before the day of the Lord, these things will take place. 
I'm going to take now this section, verses 3 through 12, and make a special lesson out of it, much like I did with that 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 13 through 18, where I uh, wrote that little uh, paper entitled Understanding the Rapture from 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. This material in 2 Thessalonians uh, 2, 3 through 12, is often used by the same group of people, in other words, the dispensational premillennialists, that talk about the rapture. The same people that talk about that that mess that up, they also mess this up also. So I hope we'll all enjoy this material. We'll pick up the rest of the chapter, uh, 13 through 17, after completing our study. Fairly certain we're not going to be doing that tonight. So turn the page. Who is this man of lawlessness? Who is this guy? Well, this mysterious man of lawlessness has been identified as identical to one or more of the following characters found elsewhere in the scriptures. So this is not who he is, but this is some, sometimes people attribute the man of lawless to being one of these people or one of these things that are also found in scripture. So they can point to another scripture and say, this is that. It's not, but that's what they say. Some say it's the Antichrist. Others say it's the beast from the sea, Revelation 11 and 13. The false prophet of Revelation 16, Belial, Deuteronomy 13. The little horn of the fourth beast in Daniel 7 and verse 8. Go back to your Daniel notes and you'll see exactly who we said that was there. The destroying prince, Daniel chapter 9. You'll see the same thing there. The abomination of desolation. Jesus spoke about that in the Olivet Discourse of Matthew chapter 24 and 25. The beast from the earth, Revelation 13. The great harlot, Revelation 17. The great red dragon, Revelation 12. Uh, the little horn of Daniel's he-goat, Daniel 8. And the willful king of Daniel chapter 11. Those are all ones that have been attributed, that the, this man of lawlessness has been attributed to being that. Well, that's not true, and I'm going to talk about why not here in just a few moments. Our job is to winnow through these tares and see if there's any wheat to be found. By process of elimination, we can remove a number from the above. For instance, the man of lawlessness is not the abomination of desolation found in those verses right there. For the abomination of desolation refers to the Roman army at the destruction of Jerusalem. Jesus in Luke chapter 20, 21, verse 20. All these are things that we can read right now if you'd like, or we can read them later if you uh, want to just charge ahead. Let me know one way or the other. This occurred, this uh, Roman army, their uh, siege of Jerusalem, this occurred during the days of the generation that was living during the day of that particular prophecy of the uh, de abomination of desolation. We read about that in Daniel chapter 9. Jesus in Matthew chapter 24, he talks about that the destruction of Jerusalem is not going to happen. He says, but until you see the abomination of desolation. And so they saw it. They saw it during the days of Vespasian. Vespasian uh, was the general who brought his, Rome's legions to surround the city of Jerusalem. Rome was just tired of Judea. One of the problems there is the zealots. Now we know that there were zealots even in our Lord's day. Uh, Barabbas was a zealot. Simon, one of our Lord's apostles, was also a zealot. The zealots were people who believed, very, they are kind of like today's Zionists over in Israel. The Zionists in Israel, or the Zionists who talk about Israel, they say, God promised us that land. God never pulled back his promise. That land still belongs to us. And so that's why uh, they constantly are dealing with the Palestinians and Arabs from various countries and all uh, that sort of stuff. Uh, but the Zionists were like that. They would wear, uh, it's called in, in Latin, I think it, the pronunciation is a sicarii. It was a dagger that they would have on, strapped to their forearm underneath their robes. And so they could go through the marketplace, but if there was uh, a Roman soldier that didn't have any others right around him, or if there was someone who did a lot of business with the Romans, was a Roman sympathizer, you know, a Tory, as it were, if we're using American Revolution uh, terminology, they would come up behind him, draw the dagger, poke the person a few times in their, uh, in their kidneys, 
which, you know, your renal artery, you cut that thing, you're toast, buddy. Uh, but they would do that. Well, Rome finally just had enough of all this stuff, and so they were going to take out everybody. And so Vespasian, here's a smart general for you. What he did was he had the, the legions outside of Rome, and, but uh, they allowed people access until I can't remember what it was, but it was one of those days, Yom Kippur, the you know, Day of Atonement or something of that nature, when what he did was all the people came in and then they closed the, they closed the circle and nobody was allowed out. So now you have thousands and thousands of people in Jerusalem for this holy day, but now the food sources are going to go away and the... Uh, you know, the, the water, uh, because of Hezekiah's uh, tunnel, they probably had water, but they didn't have food. And uh, Josephus, who was a general of the Jewish army, who was actually captured very early on in this thing, he was, because rank has its privileges, he was given free reign to walk around the camp of the Romans. And he used his time to write. I mean, you could read the writings of Josephus today. There's, a, there's the uh, Josephus, the wars, and there's other books that he has written. Well, one of the things he said about that particular engagement is for 20 miles around Jerusalem, all the hills were denuded of their trees because of the crosses that they made. Because people would try to, you know, escape during the night or something of that nature. To They're just crazed to go out and get food or whatever the case was. Well, if you were captured, you were crucified. And so for 20 miles around Jerusalem, Josephus says, the, the hills uh, were denuded of trees. So, not the abomination of desolation. Uh, and also in AD 70 is when that occurred. Vespasian in AD uh, 68 was recalled to Rome. Anybody remember why? Caesar. Yeah, they needed a new Caesar. The last Caesar had died. And so he gave the, uh, the job to his son, Titus. And Titus continued the siege for two more years. And then... Uh, in AD 70 sometime, he just brought the soldiers in. And of course, by that time, there was nothing. You know, who was going to stand up against them? They, they could barely stand up probably themselves. And so uh, uh, they destroyed Jerusalem, tore down the walls, the gates, just as Nebuchadnezzar had done. Uh, what I read, each side accused the other of starting the fire in the temple, you know, because uh, Titus was not supposed to burn the temple. But the temple did burn, and if the temple burned, what else burned? All the genealogical records. Exactly right. All the genealogical records. Those records were important for two reasons. Now, except for Donnie, <laughs> what are two, the two reasons why those genealogical records were so incredibly important to the Jews? <clears throat> to show the lineage of the priesthood. Very good. Very good. You had to be able to prove that you were of the tribe of Levi if you were going to serve as a Levite. And you had to prove that you were not only of the tribe of Levi, but the family of Aaron if you were to become a priest. And if you read like in Ezra chapter 2 and verses, I think it's like 61 and 62, you can see where some who came out of, <coughs> came out of the Babylonian captivity could not prove their, their uh, genealogy because they married girls uh, of, the, uh, of the, the Persians and they took their names. You know, like today it's our, in our culture, the wife takes the last name of the man she marries. Well, they took the last name of the woman that they married and so their names were not found in the uh, genealogies and so they were not allowed to serve. So that's one reason. What's another reason? What does Matthew chapter 1, verse 1 say? Anybody remember that? The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of Abraham, the son of David. And right after that, what does he do? And to Abraham was born Isaac, and to Isaac. And so what he does is he gives the genealogy. The Jews wanted those genealogical records because somebody could just say, I'm the Messiah. And uh, how would you disprove it? Well, one of the ways you disprove it is the person comes from the wrong tribe or the wrong family. 
That's why it says he's of, uh, you know, of Abraham, so he came from the right people. But he also was the descendant of David. David was uh, of Judah, descent from Judah. Remember in uh, uh, Genesis chapter 49, verse 10, when uh, Israel, when Jacob's giving out all the uh, blessings to his uh, 12 sons, when he gets to Judah, he says that the scepter, the scepter is the symbol of the, the king, the scepter shall not depart from Judah until Shiloh comes, until the Messiah comes. And so they, uh, I'm sure one of the things that the Pharisees did when uh, Jesus first came on the scene is they probably sent somebody, go check the records and see if this guy was, is of the right tribe. Let's find out, make sure that he was born where? Bethlehem. Born in Bethlehem, Micah chapter 5 and verse 2. And you, O Bethlehem, land of Ephrathah, are by no means least amongst the clans of Israel. For from you shall come forth one who will rule my people. And so he had to be born in Bethlehem. So, interesting stuff, I think. Any other thoughts, questions, or comments? Okay, well then moving right along. He's not John Sea Beast of Revelation 13. The Sea Beast makes war with the Christians rather than deceiving them with religious error and false miracles that we read about here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. At the time John wrote the Revelation, this beast power source was centered in the Roman Empire. So the Roman Empire uh, is what we're looking at with the sea beast there. He's not John's land beast in that same chapter, otherwise called the false prophet in Revelation 16, 13. This beast was the religious arm of the pagan civil government. So the land beast was the pagan civil government. It was the Roman Empire. You want to read about that beast? Roman, or Revelation chapter 13. That's where you can see how who this beast is. And then the... Uh, the beast, uh, verse 11, the second beast that talks about, that's the one that uh, dealt with the idea that the Caesar was God. You know, the deification of the Caesar. Since the days of Augustus, and Augustus was the first Caesar, Julius was not the first Caesar. Julius, Caesar was his, uh, you know, his name. Uh, but Augustus was the first Caesar king or Caesar of, of Rome and everyone since him or from him on was considered to be a god a god it was a, a cult more more than anything else but that's what they believed some of them most of them they didn't they didn't they knew they weren't gods they didn't think that but you had a few you had your Caligulas and your Herods and your Domitians who accepted the idea that they were God. And so what the, uh, they would do, these uh, groups would do, is they would bring a, a bust of the Caesar to a town. You know, the, from here up, something that you know, looked like the Caesar. And uh, you would either put a pinch of incense before, you know, into a little... A thing that they had burning there. You'd put a, drop a pinch of incense in and you would say something. Anybody know what you would say? Caesar. Caesar is Lord. Caesar is Lord. That's why when Paul, you know, was writing that letter to the Romans, you know, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus as Lord, and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. But they were to pronounce Caesar's Lord, or they would pour a libation before him. And so that's what said, oh no, we're, we're, we're with you. Well, of course, no Christian could do such a thing. So uh, anyhow, that was the uh, emperor worship that they had going on there. Uh, it was not, he's not the great harlot, this uh, man of lawlessness, uh, for she is identified as the great city there in Revelation 17, 18. Obviously, Rome was the capital of any, un, uh, of any ungodly government. It go goes on later to tell us, I think it's in chapter 19, where it says that on, uh, she sits on the uh, seven hills or something of that nature. Anybody know of any city that's known to have seven hills? Rome. Rome. Rome, seven hills. So that, that identifies who the great harlot is for us also. He's not Belial. See a number of places where Belial is mentioned. The word in Hebrew simply means worthlessness. Worthlessness. It is used as a synonym for Satan in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 15. 
Remember in verse 14, he talks about what fellowship has light with darkness, or, uh, and then it goes on in verse 14 and says, or Christ with Belial, or verse 15, Christ with Belial. Doesn't. He's not the great red dragon in Revelation 12, that is Satan, as it says in Revelation 12 and verse 9. He's not the little horn of the he-goat in Daniel chapter 8, for that is clearly explained as uh, <coughs> a king of the divided Grecian Empire. It was the Greeks. And obviously uh, Antiochus IV Epiphanes would be that guy. He's not the prince that shall come to destroy the city and the sanctuary of Daniel 9.26, for that was the Roman general Titus who sacked Jerusalem and destroyed the temple. Talked about him already. He's not the self-willed king or the contemptible person of Daniel 11 because that was also Antiochus IV Epiphanes who inherited a portion of Alexander the Great's divided kingdom of Greece. I, I, it's called the divided kingdom because after, after Alexander died, he was 33 years old and he had kind of conquered just about everything, but he died of wounds that he had, uh, had suffered. Well, his kings, his kings, his generals, they now were, had to divide things up. You had your strong generals, you had your weak generals. The weak generals were easily dispatched. The last four of the generals, they divided up Alexander's empire, the Grecian empire that they had. Like Ptolemy, he took down in Egypt, and then, uh, you know, uh, uh, Seleucus, he took up over uh, towards... Uh, uh, Palestine and up into I can't remember the name of the place and then you know so they divided the whole the whole empire up these four regions and then those four regions would from time to time have wars with themselves this was until uh, Rome came along and then Rome defeated all of them and became the dominant world power so we have now narrowed it down to, as to who this man of lawlessness isn't so who is he in the next section, we'll look at key elements in 2 Thessalonians 2 passage to help us identify him. Because God has given to us clues. He tells us that we will know the man of lawlessness because of several things. And so here are the key elements in that passage for us to make identification. Number one, a general apostasy is to take place first. Notice in verse 3, it says... Let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first. What does the word apostasy mean? Falling away. falling away. And so there's going to be a general falling away from the truth, from the faith, from the Christ. The apostasy that would produce the man of sin was already developing. In verse 7, he says, For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Now see, this is where some of our uh, premillennial friends, they, they somewhat struggle with that because they say the man of lawlessness, they, they would say he is the Antichrist. Uh, they say that you know, he doesn't show up until seven years uh, before the, the second coming of Jesus, if you don't count the rapture. So they say that. Well, here Paul says, no, no, no. This mystery of lawlessness is already happening. You know, so we're looking at least two millennia down the road. But he says it's already happening in his day, whereas they say it's happening in their day. So it's already developing. A restraining power or person it was holding back this apostasy during the time Paul was writing this letter. Verse 6, and you know what restrains him until now, so that in his time he may be revealed. But he can't be revealed yet because something is holding back this man of lawlessness from coming forth. Coming forth. Before I rush on any further, I should actually stop after each one of these and ask you what thoughts or questions or comments do you have about any of that stuff? <coughs> <laughs> yeah, they probably would. And then, of course, during the, uh, the Dark Ages, they would talk about the Albigensians and uh, some of the uh, other groups that split off from them. Yeah. Don't, don't get ahead of me, though, Donnie. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, 
You know, that we don't want to peek behind the curtain too soon. Okay. Yes. Yes, but are we on a budget not to have heat? Brad, could I get you to, if you could, pop it up a little bit? I, I turned on. No. Nope. Yeah. 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 <laughs> if we were the Baptist church, we'd took, pass around the Kentucky fried, Kentucky fried chicken buckets. You know how they do that. The, uh, I, at one at one thirty this afternoon, I knowing that uh, some of our members get cold here, I turned that thing on. And I think I had it. Was it at seventy seven, Brad? Yeah, but it's almost 67. Oh. <laughs> Somebody left the window See, open. Here it takes longer to warm oh. this big area. Sure, you're not the only one that's going. <laughs> but it is, it is on and running. Shaky. <laughs> we need to put a book. <laughs> Although I am glad that you uh, said that with a couple or, or three of our elders here present. <laughs> so that. Uh, <laughs> Maybe, maybe, maybe we'll spring for space heaters or something. I thought 1.30 would be good. I'm sorry, four and a half hours, I thought that would work. Or five and a half hours. Okay, number, uh, number four, the Thessalonians knew the restrainer. Oh, chivalry has not died. No. Isn't that special? Oh. What a guy. That's yeah, sweet. Oh. oh, you're so sweet. Isn't he cold? Well, <laughs> <laughs> look at you. I've been sick, and I've been wanting to get here, and I'm thinking maybe I should have stayed. <laughs> I can't concentrate. We will, we will rectify or resolve the situation, Cheryl. I hate to ask, but surely somebody else feels. Bad. I know if Shirley was here, she would feel bad too. Okay, number five: the man of sin would be revealed. We see in verses three, six, and eight when the restrainer is removed, and so the restrainer is all that they're waiting for. The man of sin, number six, would sit. That should say in, not I would sit in the temple of God. Dun, 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 dun. Number seven, he would oppose God, exalt himself, and claim divine privileges, this man of lawlessness. He would utilize false miracles. I, I was trying to wonder, should I say utilize or perform, but I went with utilize. Number nine, he would deceive those who would not love or believe the truth and would cause them to be lost. And number 10, he will continue until the second coming of Christ. And so those are all things that we see there in, the, in those verses, verses 3 through, uh, what was it, 12. Some, some ways, some clues that we might be able to identify. Who is this guy? Well, let me briefly deal with the usual suspects. Number one is Satan. Paul tells us that the man of sin is empowered by Satan in chapter 2, or verses 2 through 9, or verse, verse two, ver, chapter 2, verse 9. The one whose coming is in accord with all the activity of Satan, with all power and signs and false wonders. But if he is empowered by Satan, then this means he cannot be Satan. See, if you're empowered by something, you're not that's something. And so, uh, for example, a car is empowered by an engine, but the car is not the engine. Besides this individual, besides, comma, this individual is not some supernatural agent, for he is called a man. A man. The word anthropos, there meaning man, is never used of Satan. Anthropos does not mean Satan. Now, anthropos is a word that is used to describe mankind. Mankind. So that would, sometimes the word man includes women also. Like anthropology is the study of man, but it's the study of people, men and women. 
But there is another word that is used for the male gender. If we we're doing a, uh, uh, so, uh, a class on uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, where it's talking about prayer and men and women in prayer and all those sorts of things, I could show you where sometimes the word anthropos is used. And sometimes the word aner, which is the male gender, is used for prayer. So, but and man is never used of Satan. Next, uh, Jesus, another reason why it's not Satan is Jesus predicted false Christ and Messiahs to arise amongst the Jews. Remember that during the Olivet Discourse there in Matthew 24? Also, since Paul mentions the temple of God as we read a few moments ago, wouldn't it only be natural to assume this as Herod's temple in Jerusalem? It would. If you talk about the temple of God, what would people in the first century think? The temple in Jerusalem. That would be the natural thing to think. Besides, Jews are called a synagogue of Satan and are guilty of blasphemy and lying, as we see there in those two uh, letters that Jesus wrote in Revelations 2 and 3. And since uh, the sins of Satan, if there are uh, blasphemy, lying, and sins of Satan, if there uh, ever was any blasphemy and lying, certainly are sins. But since Paul was never shy about openly and severely denouncing the Jews, as we saw him do in the first letter, then why veil this understanding as if he's talking about Jews in this context? My whole point of saying that is to say that when he's talking about the temple of God, he is not referring to the temple in Jerusalem. Because, well, after AD 70, that temple no longer existed. And to this day, it still doesn't. Any thoughts or questions about whether Satan would be the man of lawlessness? <clears throat> Don't be shy. The next one, uh, a thought would be, well, the Roman, a Roman emperor. He's the man of lawlessness. Now, easy guess uh, would refer to Nero. You know, while he was still alive during the life of Paul, indeed, uh, in fact, he was indeed the Caesar who condemned Paul to death. He was dead long before John's revelation. That being the case, it can't be Nero when it talks about this bad guy because in the revelation we still are talking about the bad guy, but uh, uh, Nero is gone. Others have uh, posited Caligula, who predated Nero, or Vitellius, and, or Diocletian. Uh, but why would these or any Caesar be associated with the apostasy? These guys are pagans. Pagans aren't uh, uh, involved in an apostasy because they've already are fallen away. They never were holding on to something to fall from. They never were part of the, uh, uh, the truth. And so Certainly, that kind of mitigates against them. But the real nail in the coffin is that the Roman Empire and all its Caesars has long since departed into the dustbin of history. But the man of sin, that's the man of lawlessness, will continue until the Lord's second coming. And if the man of lawlessness is going to continue until Jesus comes again, well, it certainly can't be one of the Caesars because they're all dead and gone for many years now. Thoughts, questions, comments? Okay. A future world ruler. This ruler would need to be a member of the church or it would not be an apostasy. You know, he, he have to be part of something to fall from something. Nor could this word be used of a political revolt against an established government. Those who hold to this view believe the Holy Spirit is the restrainer and he keeps this man of sin at bay. Yet if the restrainer is the spirit, how do we explain uh, verse 7 where it says, He who restrains him will do so until he is taken out of the way. Who is going to take the Holy Spirit out of the way? The Holy Spirit is God. He can't be taken out of the way. Notice he, the spirit, if this view is correct, is removed. Taken out of the way is not a voluntary removal, but a forced one. And just who is powerful enough to move the spirit. So we know that the man of lawlessness is not some of those uh, group of, what is it, ten, 10 things I had on the other page, or even these usual suspects, you know, a Roman emperor or a future rule, world ruler or Satan. It's not that. So thoughts, questions, comments?
Oh, I know you're just sitting on the edges of your seat saying, Oh, tell us, tell us, please, please. <laughs> well, it looks like we'll have time maybe to tell you. Okay. The marks of identification, the same numerology will be used. Now, that's the same numerology that we used on the page that looked a whole lot like this page. See those ten things right there? The one that starts at the top. A general apostasy was going to take place first. Apostasy would produce the man of sin was already developing, blah, blah, blah. All those things. Those numbers right there are going to refer to the things that we're going to cover now. We're going to deal with those things. So, he writes, Let us return to the key elements in the passage for making the identification. It's one I just showed you. And now expand upon them. In verse 3, Paul speaks of the apostasy comes first. There are no superfluous words in the Bible. Every single word is important. Now, you have two types of articles. And I don't mean like something you read out of a newspaper. But there are two types of articles uh, that we find in all sorts of writings. One is a uh, uh, let me just do this. One is the word the. That's a specific article. If I'm talking about uh, the Bible on that lectern right there that means I'm not talking about any other Bibles that we all have on our laps or we're holding in this room. So that is a specific article. But you have a, this or specific, let me, this is the correct terminology. A definite article. But an indefinite article, or a non-specific one, is the word A. Now, if I talk about a Bible, well, that could be any Bible. You know, it could be any one of the ones we have in this room or, or any other Bible, if I just say a Bible. And so here, when Paul writes, he includes the definite article in that, uh, in that phrase when he says, this shall not happen unless the apostasy comes first. So he's talking about a very specific one. This is kind of like what uh, Donnie was alluding to uh, earlier in, the, in what he uh, said. Thus he is not talking about one defection among many. Rather it would be a general sweeping apostasy which is distinguished from all others. And those passages right there all speak of apostasy. All speak of apostasy. This one is a big one. You know, we had uh, in, in Acts chapter 20 and, and verse uh, 29. Well, I'll just start with verse 28 because we're familiar with that one. That's the passage that uh, Paul's talking to the elders of the Ephesian church. And he says, Be on guard for yourselves and for the whole flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. And, but then he goes on to say, For after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Men of your own selves, elders, will arise and speaking perverse things in order to draw away the disciples after them. Well, see, that would be an apostasy. It wouldn't be the apostasy because it would just be uh, in regards to maybe a particular congregation or several particular congregations, but it's not a general apostasy that would take place. So, uh, does that help uh, understand when he talks about the apostasy? We see that it's something, it's a big deal. It's something very big. And we see that it's already kind of happening. But, but those small ones could contribute to the big ones. Oh, yeah. Cer certainly so. But they would all be going along the same lines. It wouldn't be just the, te the false teachings of one particular elder. It would be a false teaching that uh, it would be like uh, COVID with the Omicron variant. It spreads like wildfire. You know, and that's what happened with the apostasy. Let me reveal my thoughts right here, says the teacher. I believe the greatest apostasy from the true faith is that which was promulgated by the Roman Catholic papacy. 
I believe that by the time we conclude our study of this pericope, that means this section of scripture, that either you will accept this truth or you will have a lot of studying to do or you will do a lot of studying. We, uh, we talked about, uh, I'm trying to remember which one of the uh, lessons, our Monday night lessons where we talked about this. But remember we said there were several things that uh, the early church put in place to maintain their orthodoxy. Several things they put in place to maintain the fact that they were going to stay straight. Orthodoxy. To stay straight with the truth. Does anybody remember what any of those things were? Okay. One of those things were creeds. Because, see, you have something they didn't have. You've got a complete collection of God's Word. All 66 books that uh, uh, are inspired by God, you've got that. But they had, like the Old Testament, they had the scrolls and the things of the Old Testament, but they didn't have all the New Testament. And uh, those things were still being copied, and they were still being generated, and then... I mean, every, everybody who is a member of every congregation did not have a copy of all the scriptures. And so, how could they make sure that they stayed straight? Well, they used creeds. Creeds come from a Latin word, credo, which means I believe. I believe. And so the first creed that came out was one that uh, there was a, an elder in the Lord's church from the city of Antioch. No, not Antioch. Alexandria down in Egypt. And his name was Arius. And Arius made a statement that, boy, for whatever reason, it grabbed a hold of the, of the church. And the statement was this. There was when Christ was not. There was when Christ was not. Now, if there ever was a time that Christ did not exist, then that means he is not eternal. And if he is not eternal, what else is he not? He's not divine. He's not God. But this, this was spreading. And the reason it spread is because people, they didn't, you know, they didn't have access to ways that they could uh, disprove that teaching. And so what happened is there was a gathering of all these bishops in the... Uh, a place called Nicaea. And in Nicaea, they gathered together and uh, for a number of months, quite a few months, they argued the point about how do we know that this is a false teaching versus a true teaching, da 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 da, -da. And so at the end, they came up with a creedal statement, a statement of beliefs. And this would be something very easy for them to produce. You know, just this, you could have it on one sheet of paper. And so when somebody came to town, they could test him and say, okay, do you believe that in God the Father, you know, creator of heaven and earth, and, and they could just go right down through the creedal thing. And if they answered correctly, the people would listen to this guy. Now see, it was done for a good reason. I mean, I, I don't think they set out to do something wrong, but it was wrong. And you probably have heard this before. I know I've said it before. But if a creed says less than what the Bible says, it says too little. If it says more than what the Bible says, it says too much. And if it says only what the Bible says, then it's superfluous. I mean, it's unnecessary because God's Word already says that sort of thing. Well, at the end of this creed, and you can Google this. Ask for, you know, Google original Nicene Creed. Because the creed that they have today that they call the Nicene Creed does not include two anathemas. What's an anathema? Yes, being cut off. You are cut off. Uh, and so uh, the, the first anathema said this. Anathema is anyone who says there was when Christ was not. So they didn't necessarily prove that that was not a biblical statement, but they just said, if you say it, then you're cut off. And the second one under that says, anathema is anyone who does not uh, accept or abide by all the things written in this creed. 
So what did they just do with that creed? Here's God's word, and here's a creed. They made it equal to the word of God. It's not, you know, curses anyone who does not accept all the things written in the Holy Scriptures, but curses anyone who does not agree with this creed. And so the creed then became scriptural. And, and that was just the first of the creeds. There's the Athanasian Creed. There's the Augustine Creed. There's, you probably know some. Vatican I, Vatican II were creedal statements. So that's one way that they could prove orthodoxy was the creeds. Anybody know a second way? Okay. Their leadership. Their leadership. There was a fellow by the name of Ignatius. And Ignatius lived very early in the second century. It was during a time when there was uh, persecution going on. And Ignatius was an elder in the church in Antioch. In fact, in my uh, office down the road, if you want to check out this book, I've got a, a book where we have the seven letters that Athanasius writ, wrote. Because what he was, he was on his way to Rome to be thrown into the uh, arena with the wild beast. And so he wrote letters to the church. Seven different, con seven different congregations. One of those letters tells us what was going on in the church around 124 A.D., which is when he was writing these letters, 124 A.D. Because the last thing we know is what was written in like about 95, 98 A.D. You know, that's when the Revelation was written. And so we don't, we don't know anything that happened between that time, 95, 98 A.D., until 124. So we have this, oh, like about 30-year period of time where we don't know what's been going on. But then Ignatius writes this, this letter to us. And what had happened is, uh, we have, and we'll, we'll certainly be talking about this in our leadership series, but we have today what we would call a plurality of elders. A plurality of elders. We have more than one elder. Every time it speaks of uh, the eldership in the New Testament, it always uses the plural. The only time that it uses singular is when uh, it says, if you have an accusation, or do not receive an accusation against an elder, indefinite. If you receive, telling Paul telling Timothy in 1 Timothy 5, if you receive an accusation against an elder, don't accept it except on the basis of two or three witnesses. Blah, blah, blah. And then he goes on. And so the, the leadership, well, they had this, the elders there. And then what happened was, one of those men was probably seen to be a little more spiritual, a little more knowledgeable, a little more charismatic, whatever the reason was, but they would take one of those men out of the presbytery, presbytery and they would elevate him and he would then become the bishop. Now this coming Sunday, you're going to, uh, I'm going to be doing uh, in our series, uh, that thing where we're going to look at three words that Paul wrote in the Greek language that are translated into six words in the English language. And one of those words is bishop. And so if somebody is talking about overseers, like if you have a King James Bible, if you look in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 1, you'll see where it talks about if any man aspires to the office of a bishop, it's a fine work that he desires to do. New American Standard says anyone who aspires to the office of an overseer, it's a fine work he desires to do. And so an overseer, bishop, that means the same thing. But they would take somebody who was one of the elders and make him into the bishop. That guy became known, uh, and this is not in those days, but in our days, the scholarship says that becomes the monarchical bishop. If I talk about mono... What does that mean? One. Arche means what? Like a archangel. What's an archangel? He's a ruling angel. A ruling angel. So you have one. So monarchical bishop. One ruling leader. But see, they, they thought this is a good thing because this is the one, this is our guy. He knows more than the other elders. They're all good men, but he just happens to know more. And so we put him into a leadership position. 
So you probably didn't catch it, but when I was talking about them going to Nicaea, it was the bishops that went there. And then, of course, as time went on, what happened if you have a bishop in this congregation, a bishop in this congregation, a bishop in this congregation, all in the same town? What are you going to have? What's going to happen is they're going to say, well, you know, all of us, you know, we've got all these different ideas. We need to have one person that can be in charge, that can, you know, help all three of the congregations say, speak the same thing. So they would find a, or create a, archbishop. A ruling bishop. So you have your, your uh, elders, you have your bishop, you have your ruling bishop, your archbishops, and then, of course, we know how it evolved even from there. But the orthodoxy told him, this is going to protect us. We're going to be protected from false teachers because of the leadership here. You know, what does the Catholic Church say today regarding the fact that Pope Francis, well, he's, you know, there's an apostolic succession all the way from Peter to Pope Francis, and it's been, it's a single line all the way through. It's not, but it's a single line all the way through, and that's why we can tell that we're right. We're, we're on the right path because of their leadership. What thoughts or questions or comments do you have about that? Yes, yes, they do, and see that that to me is that's crazy because we've got God's word. We don't need to read a creed. We can believe what God's word has to say. So uh, let me go on then to the third paragraph or the penultimate paragraph from the bottom of the page. The apostasy which produced the Roman Catholic Church, RCC, is the single greatest apostasy that has ever been seen in the Christian age even before being self-proclaimed to have papal power back in AD 606 where the bishop of Rome became the pope you know that's where he was he was named the pope in those days but he was the bishop of Rome but even before he uh, proclaimed himself to have this papal power the apostasy had already produced a number of number of digressions from the truth <clears throat> that produced monarchical bishops we've talked about those infant baptism came about heathen rituals in worship, human creeds, Mary declared the mother of God, forgiveness of sins by priests, a distinct priesthood within the church was developed. Today, according to what Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9, every one of us in this room is a royal priesthood, part of a royal priesthood. You don't need to go to some man to bring your petitions before God. You're a priest. You can bring your petitions before God. You don't need somebody to do that for you. So, uh, da -da -da. Uh, corruption of the Lord's Supper into the sacrifice of the Mass, etc., etc., etc. So, since the rise of the papacy, we have seen such inventions as, now this is now following 606, we've seen things like transubstantiation. Transubstantiation means what? Doesn't that mean in their mass, mm -hmm. the, um, the elements that they used become the literal body of yes. Jesus? That's exactly right. The literal body and his literal blood. Uh, the sale of indulgences. Uh, St. Peter's Basilica is, uh, was built on the sale of these indulgences. Indulgences is a way to get uh, forgiveness of sins uh, ahead of time. The worship of images, enforced celibacy, the immaculate conception of Mary. I know a lot of times you hear, we hear people say immaculate conception and they think that's talking about of Jesus. The immaculate conception is not talking about Jesus. It's talking about Mary. The reason being because a fellow by the name of Augustine is the one who codified the idea that we are born in sin. We are born sinners. And so if Jesus was, on the one hand, uh, born by the Holy Spirit coming upon Mary, so we see he has a divine uh, nature there, but if he's born by Mary, and Mary, if you know, she's human, so she was born a sinner. So he's got now a sinful nature and this nature. How do we rectify that? They, they, they're so concerned. And so what do they do? They say, oh no, 
Mary was immaculately conceived. She was not conceived in sin. And so Jesus could be born of Mary and still be deity. Uh, in this indulgences, worship of images and for celibacy, the immaculate conception of Mary, the infallibility of the Pope, the bodily assumption of Mary into heaven, to name just a few. Catholicism is a vast system of errors in both doctrine and practice. And so when we talk about identifying the, uh, the man of lawlessness, well, it seems to me that a general apostasy was going to take place. There was no greater apostasy than, like Donnie said, it didn't happen overnight. It didn't happen all at once. It was small steps Incrementalism. You've all heard the, uh, the parable of the camel's nose under the tent flap. You know, it's just Satan is willing to take just a little bit at a time. Just a little bit at a time. Until finally, you look back and you can't remember how you got to where you got. But boy, you sure know you're not where you want to be. And that's right where they're at. That's going on in our culture right today. Oh, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. For, for instance, uh, I think I mentioned this before, Cheryl, but in, in Colorado when uh, Chris and I were there, they, uh, people were saying, well, you know, can't you just make marijuana available for people who need it for a medical purpose? You know, like I, uh, you know, I, 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 when I'm going through my chemo treatments, you know, it just makes me sick. I try to eat something. I'm always throwing it up. But, but if I have some marijuana in my system, then I... I'm able to keep the food down and it helps me. Can't we at least do that? And of course, that certainly tears at all our heartstrings because we don't want people to be bad enough to have cancer. If you've got to be sick when you're having it too, that's uh, throwing up and all that stuff, that's terrible. So they put that in. And then after a while, they say, well, you know, there was all this concern that, you know, people are going to reefer madness. Anybody ever see the movie Reefer Madness? Reefer Madness, you know, and the crazy things were going to happen, but it hasn't happened. So can't we just legislate and tax the sale of marijuana, but keeping it, of course, at least uh, 150 yards away from any schools or, or daycares or something of that nature. Why don't we do that? And so, well, okay. And of course now if you go to uh, Denver, you, they, I think they have more pot shops than they have Starbucks, which is a lot. And so, see, it's just things incrementally change. And Satan, he's, he's patient. He'll just take little bits at a time. But they didn't get to calling the Bishop of Rome Pope, you know, the father of the church, until 600 years after the fact, you know, after Jesus uh, established his church. So, little things, little things happen. Doesn't this kind of show that when you have a false doctrine, people start to see the flaws in it, and so you got to have something else to cover that. <laughs> and it just, I mean, it perpetuates itself. Yes. Yeah, when, uh, uh, yesterday I, I uh, mentioned the verse that says, uh, you know, commit lawlessness which leads to further lawlessness. And that's exactly what you're talking about. You know, you, well, that's, that's wrong or that seems to be wrong, so we've got to cover that up. Yes? Anything? We want to read that, but yes, we can. <laughs> which book are we talking about? The one you told us about, the one about Ignatian. Oh, okay. I, well, then stick around because I've got a. I've got to get chapter 5 of 1 Thessalonians for, Ch- for Cheryl. So when we get done here, I will get that and I'll get you the book. If you lose the book, I will... Uh, you will find it. <laughs> I-, I will kill your firstborn. I'm sorry. <laughs> Come on, let me pick another one. <laughs> no, he's my favorite. Use another one. I'll tell you the one again. Okay, number two. Looks like we have time for this. Uh, number two, the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. We know a Bible mystery. When the Bible uses the word mystery, and it uses it a number of times, that is something which could never be known without God revealing it to us. So if the Bible talks about a mystery, there's no way that anybody could have ever divined that thought, could ever come up with the answer to that mystery, unless God is the one who revealed it. So Paul is saying uh, the error 
that is, the, whatever's causing the apostasy, is already creeping into the church. John agrees with this in 1 John chapter 2 and in verse 18. 1 John, Rick, 1 John. 1 John 2, 18 says, Children, it is the last hour, and just as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have arisen. From this we know it is the last hour. So when John's writing this, he says there are lots of people who are against Jesus and their teachings out there. Because that, that's, you know, when we hear Antichrist, immediately people start saying, well, it's talking about this one individual. No, Antichrist means anybody who is teaching things that are opposed to Christ. If it's opposed to uh, him or his will, that is Antichrist. That is opposed to the will of God. So, in previous studies... I'm talking to uh, the Monday night crowd here, of course. In previous studies, we have seen how the eldership evolved into a priesthood through, uh, with mediatorial powers, you know, like the letter of Ignatius that I've now just given away. Uh, this was in spite of the fact that God said, there is one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. And so, uh, so anyhow, the, the thing is, is that there are lots of problems out there. But the mystery of lawlessness, it was already happening. Paul warned the Ephesian elders that there would be men in the eldership who would arise, speaking perverse things, in order to draw away the disciples after them. When we couple this with what John had to say about Diotrephes and his desire for preeminence, that's in 3 John, you know, uh, Diotrephes who loves to be first among them. Well, we can perceive the germ of a plan which would lead to a papal hierarchy. And so... It's always been about the guy. You know, the focus, it's either on Jesus or it's, in the, it's all focused on the wrong thing. That's where our focus needs to be. It's always on Jesus. If we're focusing on uh, something other than Jesus, we're focusing on the wrong thing. Thoughts, questions, comments? Like the Pope, I'm sure he's heard all this. I don't know how. He can sit there with a smile on his face. Yeah, well, it's pretty, it's pretty good to be Pope. Well, the, the reason he does is because they have, I may, I may not have mentioned it uh, in here when you were here, Melissa, but the Catholic Church today, if you have a, uh, a sit-down kind of discussion with them regarding any number of things, they will tell you that they have two sources of authority. They have the Holy Scriptures and they have the traditions of the Holy Fathers. And so guess which one of those has preeminence? Yeah, if, if they have a tr you know, one of the traditions of the Holy Fathers, you know, those traditions would come out of their creedal statements and all the acta of the various councils and that sort of stuff. And so if they have that, then they feel confident that they're right. I mean, they have a prayer that the Holy Spirit would lead them into the truth. Well, the Holy Spirit has already revealed all the truth. So he doesn't have to lead them into it because they've already got it. They're just not willing to accept it. So that, that's the reason why. Today, you, you could say, I mean, something as simple as, uh, you know, where do you find that the bread turns into the literal body of Christ and the blood turns into his literal, literal the crew of the vine turns into his literal blood? They'll have, they'll say, well, over in this area, you know, this particular thing. And they'll say, that, see, that says it. You might say, yeah, but that was written by men who were inspired by God. No, they weren't. Yes, they were. No, they weren't. You see, it just becomes them just a shouting match. I'm sure we all have good friends that were Catholic. Yeah. I just talked to a man in the H-E-B and I asked him to come here. But he got out of it. He said, our, the Catholic Bible is exactly like our Bible. He said, now they, I said, but what about the other book? He said, that's right. He, he got out of the Catholic Church, but he now goes to the Praise Church. And I said, why don't you come on over? we got a Monday night class. Man, you can, it's a great, uh, let, you know, you'll study with us. It's a bunch of people, and some of them have come from other, you know, denominations. And we can all study, and no one's going to sit there and tell you, oh, you're a sinner. I said, because we're all sinners. I said, but uh, you can come. And he says, oh, no, I've been told I'm in the right place where I'm needed at the Praise Church. And he was going, <laughs> but he was, now he believed 
the Catholic Church. It was very sinful. He said, it's so, so and I thought, but how does he really know? Mm -hmm. How does he really know? Because he's been told what to think all of his life. And so, and they have, my good friends, they're all, they don't know anything really about the Bible themselves. Yeah, well, they trust their priest. He wouldn't lie to me. Yeah. Not only that, the, they believe or have been taught that the Pope speaking in ex cathedra is really receiving revelation from God. So no matter what he changes to, he's speaking on behalf of God. Yes. One of the, That's my understanding. One of, one of the titles uh, is of the Pope is the Vicar of Christ. And the vicar means that that's the, the voice of, of Christ on earth. Do you, know, you use the right word, uh, Cheryl. Do you know what ex cathedra means? In the church. No, that's right. Out of, right? Yeah, ex, ex means out of. Out of the chair. Out of the chair. The uh, cathedra is, is Latin for chair. Remember Jesus, uh, and I think it's uh, Matthew chapter 23, he talks about how the scribes and the Pharisees uh, have seated themselves in the chair of Moses. Now the chair of Moses would be like what I'm sitting in here, and then the scrolls would be brought before them, and they would read from you know, the Bible. The scrolls contain the words of God. And so they'd read from the scrolls. And so Jesus says, so all that they tell you, do and observe. So when somebody is reading the Bible, that's what we're called to do and observe. Not because that person said it, but because God's word says it. He says, but, but do not do according to their deeds, because they say things, but they do not do them. So the chair. And so the chair became the place where the person would teach from. And uh, later, they, uh, that chair became so significant or so important that when they were producing a, a building for the people to come to and worship, what did they call those buildings? Cathedrals. Cathedrals. That means the building that houses the chair. And so, yes, so when the priest speaks uh, from the chair, they, they would say, he's important. But yes, the pope... The Pope is said to be infallible when he speaks ex cathedra. Now, not every word that he says is uh, spoken ex cathedral, cathedra, but when he says that it is, then you can write that down. He says this comes from God. Sounds a lot like Fauci. <laughs> <laughs> well, we went almost the whole time tonight without talking about that. <laughs> I don't know. It is. Okay, well then. Roman Catholic and Apostolic Church. So, like Cheryl said, they got this connection all the way back to Peter. Yep. They can reproduce it and show how they go all the way back. It's, it's a great, <laughs> it, it's a great uh, thing to do is to uh, look at a, a good book on church history. And you will discover that there were times when there were three different popes. So how did you know which pope was the one who was uh, the right one? You know, if they have actually three different popes. But that was a different time. There's also the legend, as far as I know, that there was a female who was a pope for a time. And, you know, so they have all sorts of crazy stuff. Well, the Eastern Orthodox, they don't have infant baptism. No, All right. they don't have him to baptism, and they're. That's exactly. Tolstoy exa was uh, not a, a fan of uh, infant baptism at all. Well, I mean, it, and and the Greek Orthodox, they they recognize that uh, you know, like the words for sing do not mean sing and play. You know, that sort of thing. And the word baptizo means plunge, dip, or immerse. It doesn't mean sprinkle. And so, you know, they're right on, on a number of their things also. That's not, not the main reason, but it's part of the reason for the Great Schism way back in the 12th century. The Great Schism is where the Western Church, which is where Rome was considered the Western Church, and the Greek Orthodox was considered the Eastern Church, they, they split. And so they had... Michael Cellularius, who was the, the leader of the Eastern Church, 
and I don't remember the name of the uh, Pope, but he's the one who put, <clears throat> they used to call it a, a writing, was called a bull when it was sent by the church. So they had the bull of excommunication that some men brought and laid on the altar of the church, the Hagia Sophia, the church there in Constantinople or Istanbul, the Greek Orthodox head church. And he put it on the altar and says, we have excommunicated you. And it wasn't too much longer after that that Michael Salarius, he wrote a bull of excommunication and gave it to some people and they put it on the uh, big old lectern podium sort of thing in the uh, Catholic Church there in Rome and says, no, we have excommunicated you. <laughs> so there they are. <laughs> no, you can't. We fired you. I quit before you. So you're equating the Eastern or uh, Orthodox as the Grecian Orthodox. They're synonymous? Yes, that's what I'm saying is they're synonymous. Okay. I've never heard of the Eastern. The Greek Orthodox or the Eastern. Yeah, it, it, I just, that term is just used to distinguish it from the Western Church. I mean, that, that kind of giving a nod to the uh, origins of this, that church because of the schism. Wouldn't Greek be sort of like definite and then Eastern indefinite? It's yes. A little more generalized? Yes. I mean, just so we, we can understand the words, I mean, what that I did over here. Yes. Yeah, so that the nationalism doesn't, doesn't rear up and resent too much the Greek. Yep. Yeah, church history is really, it was one of my favorite classes because it. You know, you see the word history, and I know you've probably seen this before, where somebody writes the word history on a board and then takes a, a line and draws it between the S and the T of uh, history. And they said, no, it's history, you need to understand, is his story. And truly, we see God's uh, workings through the affairs of men throughout all secular history. You know, they're not going to give God credit for it. But God's the one who determined the times and the epics of the various... Uh, kingdoms and rulers and, and people and things of that nature. God's in charge. Any other last minute thoughts, questions, or comments? Is there uh, any specific uh, text that you would recommend on I, You know, I haven't, I've, mine, the, the one that I used is probably no longer even in print because, you know, they're finding other stuff all along. But if you can find, and I don't know how you would distinguish that whether it's conservative or not, but but I'm sure most most of them are going to talk about some really some good things, talk about origins and stuff, because you know some of the most interesting time was not necessarily the days of the Reformation, but the days that preceded the Reformation, because you see a lot of things happening in those days. So that movie there or the play that was made from from uh, Cervantes. Uh, book uh, was interesting, you know, with the, the street theater protesting. The, oh yes. You know, the, the Bible's not being translated into common language of people. You know, and a, you know, a play within a play. Yeah, the, those people ended up dying. I mean, when the yeah. you know. Spanish Inquisition. Yeah, yeah, Spanish Inquisition. That Bill Clinton, more than. <laughs> Spanish, Spanish Inquisition really was a land grab of the Catholic Church, taking the, the lands, the money, and all the things of the Jews who were there in Spain. That's how they were making their money. And, and guys like, I, I mentioned John Huss, uh, uh, John Wycliffe, you know, different people who were translating the scriptures into the language of the people, and uh, they were being burned at the stake for, being, for heresy. Oh yeah, yeah, they got out quick if they're smart. You know, El, El Cid, you know, that whole thing. You know how evil they were for doing the Spanish Inquisition, all that kind of stuff, killing them, and yet they turned Catholic. All those countries that they went in there and did that to. Uh, they would know that they were pretty evil. Well, they, uh, the thing is, is once the, uh, after the 6th century when Muhammad came on the scene, yeah. All of North Africa became Muslim. You know, the Spain held on to uh, the Catholic Church because the the Spaniards. No, that's too long. Uh, part of the history, the 
the, the Moors, the, the Saracens, the Muslims, they had a pincer thing going where on this side they were going up through uh, Palestine and into uh, Turkey and they were going to try to take over Constantinople. And then they were also coming, they'd gone over North Africa, and now they come up through Spain, Portugal, and they're, if it wouldn't have been for one man who was a visionary, 10 years ahead of time, he said, we need to stop using uh, farmers for soldiers. We need to have an army who is ready to take on these people. And so for 10 years, he trained and equipped an army. His name was Charles Martel, Charles the Hammer. And uh, he was actually the uh, grandfather of a fellow by the name of Charlemagne. Pretty cool. But anyhow, he stopped them at the, at the Battle of uh, Was it Tours? Tours, yes. The Battle of Tours. And then after that, they never got any further. And then they started being driven out of France, driven out of Spain, and then they were driven out of... Too bad the Catholic Church wasn't driven out of South America. Because <laughs> yeah, they took over all that. Oh, yeah. And, and, you know, Pizarro, he made sure that the uh, Incas were all uh, yeah. Catholic. And That's what was so bad. That's what they did. Yeah. Okay, let's go ahead and have a prayer and then we can uh, uh, do whatever. Father, thank you so much for uh, helping us to understand your word better. Father, we recognize that Satan has been at work uh, very early on. He's been seeking to destroy the, uh, the words that your son said would never be destroyed, but Satan has tried to either dis destroy them or to, uh, uh, to change, to alter them, to make them say things they don't say, and, and all the other things, Father, that have gone on. And we know that countless souls have died because, uh, in the name of religion, but a false religion. Father, I pray that you will help us, but help others also, to be able to speak the truth to, uh, to those who are currently enslaved and bondage to this particular uh, belief system. And Father, so that we might reach out to those people, not so that they'll go from the frying pan into the fire of a praise church, but Father, they will return to you through your bride. Father, help us to love people enough to share with them the truth and to share it in a, a gentle, kind, and loving fashion so that they might be willing to receive the truth. Father, thank you so much for giving us your truth, your Son. Help us, Father, to live our lives always in a way that we may glorify you through him. For we offer this prayer to you in his name.